Fancy sponsoring the Battle Fever Network? Fancy having your business, company logo, or our social media graphics, and your details being read out on our shows? Well, now you can. Get in touch with us on any of our social media platforms or email us at battlefeverpod at outlook.com. That's battlefeverpod at outlook.com. Hashtag keep the battle fever on. This show is brought to you by the Battle Fever Network. If you haven't already, then please follow us on all social media platforms. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and TikTok. Just search the Battle Fever podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and never miss a pod again. Hit that subscribe button and you're in. If you don't, We'll send Paul at Seas round to your door for a talking to. And trust me, you don't want that. You can talk for days. It is safer, really, just to subscribe. His red facet is beautiful. It's deep in history. And I know what I'll find when the place comes alive. I got that battle. When I was a young boy, my father said to me, Put this scarf around your neck and sing the blues with me. And now I am much older, there's a place I wanna be. It's red faucet, it's beautiful, it's deep in history. And I know what I'll find. When the place comes alive, I got that battle fever coming over me. And I got butterflies and hurricanes shaking my body. Battle fever coming over me. And I'll follow on and sing the songs as blue. Hello all and welcome to the Rangers Women's Football Show on the Battle Fever Podcast. I am Rhiannon and as always I am joined by my trusty co-pilot Car. Car, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Excited and, about this. Uh, I'm buzzing myself, I'm not going to lie. As you can see, we've got an extra special guest. It's almost Super Tess on my dad. Tess, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. Like, as you can see, the, the sky behind me is blue. So I'm, I'm sitting outside, <laughs> actually the, the quality of the, well, my microphone is good enough uh, despite being outside, but the um, weather is amazing, so uh, yeah, I'm in a great mood. <laughs> get used to the sun, you'll probably have it for a couple of days and it'll be okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is your summer this year. <laughs> <laughs> get my tan in. Yeah, <laughs> quite right. We bit melatonin and you'll be fine. <laughs> So, um, obviously, we played on Wednesday at Pathology. How did you find that experience, Tess? Did you enjoy it? Was it was it good? Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was a bit of a surprise, almost, that so many people turn out, um, turn out to watch the game. Uh, like, I remember the moment when we walked through the tunnel onto the pitch. And I was like, wow, they actually, you know, they make good noise, the, the crowd. <laughs> so, uh, credits to, uh, to Aberdeen and, and, of course, to you guys for travelling uh, <laughs> All the way to Aberdeen, um, yeah, to to support us. Uh, but I, I think uh, me myself and the, the whole team actually really enjoyed the, the whole, uh, uh, yeah, occasion. Um, especially coming off the back of two years of COVID pandemic, where uh, yeah, for most games uh, there weren't any spectators, um, yeah, allowed, um, or even the Scottish League being, uh, yeah, postponed for for a short while. So it was almost like back to, um, yeah, back to normal, which was great. That's good. Well, we're going to kind of touch on that. What is it like having fans back? Are you enjoying it? Because obviously you must have been playing without fans. It must have been quite a weird experience. Yeah, so last year uh, I played for Fiorentina in Italy and we like like zero fans at the games, like the whole season. Um, so yeah, that was a bit of a weird experience. So um, yeah, it's just great uh, this season starting uh, yeah in July. We had some uh, friendlies, but then in August kicking off the, the season, uh, yeah, to be able to have fans back at the game, it just, uh, yeah, makes for a more, like, uh, yeah, full experience almost of being pro- uh, a professional footballer. And and to have that in- interaction with you guys, with the fans, um, yeah, it's just great. Glad you enjoy it. Carl, you want to ask him? Because I feel like I'm just kind of taking over. <laughs> well, I've got a few things to talk about. I'll just start at the top of the list. You, like, on in your career, you're not really known for scoring. That's not your your remit shall we say but you know you've scored two goals now what's that like 
oh, it's so good. It's actually such a great feeling. And probably because I don't score a lot of goals, it feels like even extra special <laughs> when you do. Uh, but to be honest, like my first um, official like uh, season at senior level, um, when I was 18, um, I played for ADO Die Haag, uh, ADO Den Haag, like, uh, back in that day. Um, I actually scored, I don't remember, like uh, 10 goals, I think, in the season. So um, I actually I can score, but I somehow ended up not scoring a lot of goals <laughs> afterwards. Also because of the fact that I um, drop down a little bit, like from an eight position more to a six position. So you're yeah don't yeah you don't show up in front of the goal maybe as much, um, but I mean at least I have two this season hopefully uh, or maybe we can add an, uh, a couple more, um, but yeah the feeling to yeah to score a goal and especially if it's the winning goal and especially if it's uh, yeah an important goal that yeah and there there are not many things in life that can actually beat that feeling if I'm on. Fair enough, can't argue with that. So obviously you, you joined Rangers. What what made you want to come in the club in the first place? What was it about the club that made it so special? You thought, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go there. So the first contact was made with Kevin Murphy, the assistant coach, uh, who I know from my time at Man City, um, and who I yeah highly uh, appreciate as a as a person as well. So that sort of was the first uh, yeah contact, and then uh, had many chats and calls with Malky and Amy, and just a whole yeah project the the people the the, the kindness uh, and, and the great facilities at uh, the training center in Milgai um, were all part of uh, yeah my uh, final decision to to decide to come here and actually yeah it was very it was almost like an easy decision to make and I felt very confident that it would have been uh, that it was the right one but you never really know until you um, move somewhere but I'm really happy that uh, eight months uh, into my time at Rangers um, yeah, I just feel so uh, so happy and valued as a person and as a player at this club and in, in Glasgow. So uh, it's been a good move so far. Good. And we definitely appreciate having you here. That's for sure. Cheers, guys. <laughs> um, you played some time with the national team for obviously the Netherlands. Like, what was that like? That must have been amazing. Yeah, absolutely. So I've, I've been lucky enough to play 44 caps for my country. Um, yeah, it's, uh, Started joining the national team when I was 18, made my official debut when I was 19. Um, yeah, and just every time you put on the, the orange shirt and represent your country, it's a very special feeling. The national anthems and yeah, just playing uh, international uh, elite football. Um, yeah, it's been yeah very rewarding. And um, yeah, um, because of my injuries, it uh, stopped quite um, yeah, suddenly, my whole sort of journey with the national team. Um, and there's still a part of me that hopes that, uh, yeah, if I can continue to play well and stay fit, um, yeah, um, I might get a call up one day again. Um, but if this is it, then yeah, it's been uh, yeah great to uh, to represent my country. It's one of the biggest uh, honors you can get, and just uh, yeah, to be able to compete on the on the highest level internationally as well has been uh, yeah a great challenge and, and experience and. Um, yeah, one of the highlights for me has been my um, the, the World Cup in 2015 in Canada. It was a yeah a great uh, great tournament for us. We were actually going to ask you about that. What was like kind of the World Cup because it feels to me because um, I kind of started watching women's football like 2011. So you can see the kind of journey it's been on since then. So like I was we were just going to touch on what that experience would have been like because it seemed like such a big occasion in Canada. They just everybody seems so into it. So it just it just looked wonderful. How was it actually playing in the tournament? Yeah, we it probably for me as a player it almost felt the same, um, and especially because the, the the press back home in the Netherlands for probably for the first time. Um, really uh, decided to pay a lot of attention uh, to it. So all the newspapers were there, all the TV stations. Um, the only thing that was a bit unlucky was the timing of the games, um, which was uh, during the night in uh, back home in yeah. the Netherlands because of the time difference. Um, but it felt for the first time that, yeah, that there were large amounts of people actually following us. Uh, so that put yeah quite a lot of like pre uh, like pressure on us. That was new. To us, like we, yeah, hadn't before hadn't really de dealt with that amount of, um, yeah, attention and pressure. So, yeah, very good learning curve and experience. And we played Canada as well um, in Vancouver, it was, I believe, and uh, yeah, sold out stadium. And that was the first experience 
in my life that I couldn't really communicate well with my teammates on the pitch like we because the noise was just so loud yeah. so that was um yeah a new experience yeah for us and for me as well that uh yeah that were so many people turning up for a women's football game that's amazing that <laughs> sounds really cool yeah and it's, it's funny though you have to be almost you have to find ways to still try and communicate <laughs> with each other you know if, if the ball goes out uh, or almost like fake an injury at times if you really need to get together or <laughs> do something with hand gestures so um, yeah uh, brought some new challenges for us that, that, that sounds actually amazing obviously I, I was just a fan watching it and it was quite difficult at times because of the time difference but it just looked like as I said such a spectacle and then obviously seeing it again in 2019 in France it just seems like it's it's grown and grown so obviously you're a women's footballer and you've been kind of you've had a, a kind of story career you've been to many different countries how how do you see women's football growing like where do you see it in maybe five years um, well, I think the um, the growth will only uh, continue. Um, I think there's so much potential. Uh, I think more and more girls actually find out that they uh, that's that it has become a realistic dream to, for example, play for Rangers uh, when they're older. Um, so I think well, like if you look at the Rangers Academy, for example, the the, the quality of the players, their technical abilities, it's it's unreal. <laughs> uh, I, I only wish that I would have had that uh, yeah, amount of attention to detail and, and, and coaching when I was that young. So, I mean, the level is only going to um, going to increase. And I think what's important for, for women's football is, um, even though we have to strive for like equal standards when it comes to pitches and coaches and um, facilities, um, I would like anyway for, for women's football to still have its own sort of image or its own, um, yeah, feeling towards it that like we don't have to copy everything that's happening in the men's game right now when it comes to the huge salaries for example or the uh yeah the greed maybe that sometimes uh, creeps in um yeah i think that's going to be a challenge that we even though we want to we're striving for like better standards maybe the goal should be to strive for equity rather than equality so it shouldn't necessarily have to be at the exact same level as men's football in every aspect if that makes sense no that makes, that makes perfect sense yeah definitely because if you compare it like when you go to a women's game like you say like you come and talk to us a lot of the girls will come over and speak to us it's the same on most games you go to a scotland game or a national game they'll come and talk to you you don't get that in the men's game it's not that same personability so i i, I agree with you there i would like it to stay that way that it is more kind of not family friendly per se, but more personable and more kind of human. Whereas male football is, it's more, they're celebrities and more kind of idolized than just people that play football. So I'd agree with you there that it would be nice to keep that kind of feeling of women's football. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. That everyone feels welcome as well, um, whether you're man or woman or straight or gay or black yeah. or white. Uh, yeah, that, that would be the ideal situation that everyone feels feels welcome and can be themselves yeah definitely I would agree I think one thing I really like about women's football is like you don't get that the diving and, and the stuff like you see in the men's game like somebody gets tackled and it's like they've been shot in the leg and it's like what are you doing? like that just I think that detracts me from men's football sometimes because it's just like showboating and play acting whether it's when I come to watch you guys or I watch Scotland or whatever, like it's just I'm just enjoying the football and the atmosphere is great and you can just sit and watch good quality of football and I, I really enjoy like the standard of play in leagues. Like it's just it's so such a difference, but it's so nice to watch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's up to us players to try and increase that level every every single year. Um but yeah, glad to hear that you're already enjoying our football. <laughs> <laughs> it can only get better. <laughs> Well, we kind of wanted to touch on that. Obviously, fan engagement's like a big deal when we're discussing what it's like to have fans back. Like, what, what do you feel clubs can do to kind of attract more fans into stadiums to come and watch women's football? Um, well, I think uh, what we touched on earlier, the, uh, the game that we played last Wednesday in the uh, Aberdeen Men's Stadium was a great occasion for us. And I think they timed it really well because it was during uh, a men's international uh, period. Um, so yeah, obviously it would be great if we could, um, yeah, well, attract more fans or maybe even um, make more 
like Rangers men's fans aware of that there is actually a women's team as well. I don't know uh, yeah, if every supporter knows that. Um, and I think it would be great for them to see that there's another team that's also competing for trophies um, and that's hopefully yeah, playing uh, enjoyable football to watch. Um, so, yeah, we're all uh, hoping that one day we can uh, play a game uh, at Ibrox ourselves. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I think it's just a matter of yeah, continuous growth um, and, and getting ourselves out there um, in the communities within the club. Um, like, I think we have to remember as well that uh, for Rangers, it's only the second year or season that they have a professional women's team. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we can um, increase the level of fan engagement uh, every year. Um, obviously, a big goal for us this season is to secure um, international football, like Champions League. That could hopefully, um, yeah, get more people uh, coming uh, to watch our games as well. So, um, yeah, what we've seen in the, in the Netherlands as well is that when um, when the women's team won the Euros in 2017, that was a massive boost for women's football in general. So, um, yeah, again, it's down to us as well to uh, hopefully be as successful as we can be, um, because we know that uh, yeah, success also brings um, brings more people to the game. You were saying about uh, the stuff that Rangers does in the community. Also, it was announced today that um, Rangers received a grant to kind of to kind of do up the facilities across from my books of pictures and all that. What do you think that will do for kind of girls, girls and women's football in general having a better standard of facilities? It's not at club level; it's just kind of there for everybody to use. Yeah, I'm really sorry. There's someone behind me with a suitcase now. <laughs> so, <laughs> it doesn't make too much noise. <laughs> The locals of Glasgow. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's funny that you mentioned that actually, um, because me and Kayla and Amy McDonald, our general manager, we went to Ibrox this afternoon um, yeah. to be to be there, um, yeah, to basically um, celebrate the, the, the funding that um, that was received to regenerate the pitch near Ibrox, um, and that's going to be a massive, um, yeah, boost to. I, I think the the girls' academy is going to train there as well but, it, but mainly it's like it's going to be a community-based uh, pitch wow. and it's just um yeah uh, another great example of how the club can um yeah uh, connect with the with the community um uh, maybe even more than we're than they're already doing um i think things like the museum that's so rangers is opening a museum later this year can also yeah, increase that that local fan base uh, feeling so I think there, there are a lot of good projects going on at the moment that hopefully um, yeah, make more people uh, yeah, willing to engage with Rangers in whatever way they can. Yeah, we were going to ask about that because uh, we'd had a meeting with Amy about the fan group and the supporters group and stuff. And she'd mentioned that you'd really taken a keen interest in the museum and had been doing stuff to help with it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a guy called Joseph or Joe. Uh, he's like the club. Uh, historian so he works in the in the archive room at Ibrox so I've met him a couple of times and there's just it's just pure gold in that room uh, like loads of like old minute books for example from the from the directors like starting as early as I think, 1879 oh, wow. um, so there's a lot of yeah history there and, and I think the club is only yeah uh, only recently starting to like discover almost everything that they have uh, in their own house um, so yeah they come across some beautiful old like um uh, how do you call it like a uh, banners uh like fans banners and like old trophies and medals and and letters written to the club like as i said as early as like end of the 19th century uh obviously the club has a very long and rich history 150 years uh, this year so um yeah uh, for me it's, uh, i've studied history myself and i um yeah, I need to write my master dissertation, so I feel like there's a lot of material that I could potentially use, um, yeah, for my own uh, research. That's amazing. Are you, are you still actively studying, or have you kind of put that off while you're doing the football thing, and then you'll go back to that? Um, well, my goal was to, to be very actively studying this year, but um, if I'm honest, <laughs> it's been mainly, <laughs> my focus has been mainly on football and, and discovering Glasgow and... Uh, um, yeah, so I'm not as far with my research as I would have liked, but I'm, I'm still active. The thing is as well, like my deadline for my dissertation is August 2023. So okay. there's at the moment not a real pressure, so I probably need that. So 
come August 2023, I should hopefully have um, written something about the history of Scottish women's football. Um, oh, wow. But uh, yeah, I haven't uh, done too much uh, as of yet, so I won't be able to tell too much uh, yeah, about it right now. But hopefully, if you ask me in a couple of months' time, I'm yeah, I'm a little bit further. Yeah, that's the summertime. Once we've won the league and everything, yeah. you, can, you can focus first on that first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, you were at, at Hamden um, for the museum and you were kind of doing the stuff with Kings Park. What was, was that like? Was that an enjoyable experience for you? Because obviously, I know you're, you just said you're a bit of a history buff. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I got in touch with Fiona Skillen, a female historian, and she's been doing a lot of amazing research on the. Uh, yeah, I'm Scottish women's football, and she also recently received a FIFA grant, which is great. Um, and so she and a couple of others are, um, yeah, trying to uncover the, the, the rich, actually, history of, of uh, Scottish women's football. Because the, the first modern, uh, the first official women's game with modern rules was played in Edinburgh in 1881. Mm -hmm. So, wow. um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, history in, in this country when it comes to female pioneers. Um, and the exhibition that's on at the moment at Hamden Museum, it's still on, by the way, uh, is on a team called the Rudder Glen Ladies FC. Um, and they were basically yeah, a team full of uh, trailblazers that played football in the 1920s and the 1930s. Um, at a time where it was really not deemed um, yeah, suitable for women or even ethical for women uh, to play uh, football. So, um, but yeah, they, they still toured across Scotland, played games in England and Wales and Northern Ireland as well. So, um, yeah, actually, it's always in, almost inspiring to find out a bit more about those yeah, uh, yeah, teams that played in the past because they, um, like, we're fortunate enough, like, I'm fortunate enough to make a living out of playing football. But uh, our predecessors, uh, the ge generations before us, they had to, um, yeah, they obviously didn't earn money. Uh, and also um, had to deal with much more criticism almost from uh, from society just because they wanted to play football. And it's good to remember that in only in 1974, uh, the ban on women's football was lifted in Scotland. So that's not even that's not too long ago, no. unfortunately. Yeah, so, didn't uh, mother yeah. girl ladies play when it was still like illegal for women to play football, and they can, they just carried on regardless. They were like. No, we're going to do this. We don't care about your laws. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's you, know, you, you got to admire the, uh, those. Uh, yeah. Words. That's yeah. absolutely brilliant. Some mocks. It's, 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 a, it's a Glasgow based team. So, you know. Yeah. Glasgow uh, has a rich history when it comes to uh, women's football. Obviously, because you would discuss, like, especially for us growing up, like now, we didn't really have female kind of footballers to look up, look up to. So for yourself, obviously, you you know, you can into football. What got, you, what got you into football? Like, who were kind of people that inspired you to kind of go forward and go, no, I, w I would like to do this as, as a career I would like? Um, so I've been playing football my, my whole life. So I don't remember it being almost like a conscious choice. I just, it was the most popular sport. Everyone played it in schools and um, on the streets. So, yeah, I naturally... <laughs> decided to do that as well and I was quite a boyish girl growing up so my friends were like like male um so I just did what they did um and um <laughs> well, I, yeah, turned, turned, it, <laughs> turned out that I was pretty pretty good at it but that only came at a later stage I think I was scouted for the first time when I was um 10 years old oh wow um, but even even back then I I didn't know or it wasn't like a realistic dream um to to become a professional footballer one day so i just i don't know i just love playing football and that's what i did then i started training more and more um and i think when i was 14 i was selected for the under 15 national team the youngest like yeah youth national team that we had and i think that's the moment where it really started to get a bit more serious and i was like oh Oh, but I, I even found out that there was a senior women's team. Like, I didn't even know. No. There was no oh, wow. coverage of it, like, in newspapers, on the TV. I was like, oh, well, it would be cool if I could one day, you know, turn on the, uh, put on the, yeah, the national team jersey. So I think that's when it started, my sort of dream. That's amazing. It's really cool. It's amazing stuff you find out when you start to get into things, all because I was in a taxi, um, 
was it last week maybe in the taxi driver that even though like Rangers or Celtic had women's teams it's like it's starting to get it's starting to get popular so it's it's really interesting to kind of hear other people's stories about kind of what got into football it's kind of similar for us I would say it's just Scotland's such a footballing country you just kind of follow it and that's it so it's been nice yeah. that for me to see the growth because I was into the women's team maybe not as much as I should have been but now that we're professional and you kind of see the growth I'm like I'm actually able to go and it's just such a massive difference to maybe when I was like 10 or whatever there was and yet that I didn't even know women's football was a thing so it's nice it's just a really odd experience to be sitting here almost 13 being like we've got a professional team and we're going to and it's just such a nice change in pace I guess yeah and I think for Scotland the World Cup in 2019 in France yeah mm. massive a massive, massive. Uh, yeah Massive growth for the women's women's team. So hopefully the Scottish national team continues to to do well and qualify for tournaments. Um, because that's yeah, unfortunately this summer so that's not going to happen. But hopefully in the next tournaments they will um, yeah qualify because yeah that means a massive boost for uh, for the clubs here in Scotland as well. I think you've seen that um, when we did qualify, we had that uh, friendly at Hamden. I think there was almost nineteen thousand people for a friendly against Jamaica. So you could see that. You know, as you said, what qualifying for major tournaments will actually do, how much it will impact the kind of women's game. Um, we kind of discuss it a lot. I don't think it helps a lot of the clubs are kind of, you know, not professional yet. I think so. Some of the kind of disparities and the discrepancies, um, it it's not great that way because people, you know, you know, interest is always a part time team. But I would, you know, I think maybe once people get more invested and there's more money kind of going in it, it could become more professional. I think that would maybe help women's football going forward, is, for me, would be more investment in the teams. Absolutely. And I think Rangers has, has set a brilliant example of uh, yeah how, it's, how it can be done. Uh, so hopefully, yeah, other teams will follow suit um, to increase the overall yeah um, level of the of the league as well and make it even more exciting for, for fans to follow. Um, so, yeah, hopefully other clubs can... I think, I think Hips is going uh, gonna go professional uh, next year. Ooh, so that would so that's be a good. good sign. Yeah, um, that's it's interesting when you say professional because probably the, um, uh, the even the players who play for clubs who are part time they probably feel professional and rightly so because they their application is well the same as someone who gets uh, paid full time for it, but they just yeah. have to because they don't earn enough have to work second jobs and it would yeah. be great if they um, yeah get into a position where they um, yeah can can commit full-time to football alone because that will only increase the level. I think that shows a love for the game as well, but that they are willing to kind of, they have to have that second job, but they're still there every week. And like some of the teams, like obviously the Spartans game is a prime example. Like they're such a, a well-oiled machine. They know exactly what the game plan was. So like just because you're not a full-time professional player and, you, and that's not your main focus, it doesn't mean that you're not a bad, like you're, not, you're bad at football. Like some of the, the, the players and the other teams are absolutely fantastic. And like some of the games, like, Hibs and Hearts and stuff like the fans that we're getting like some of those games are really exciting to watch it's just it's nice to see it's refreshing to see yeah and I yeah and I hope that yeah the every player in this league um yeah sooner rather than later can yeah uh, yeah focus full time on football as soon as possible that would be nice we wanted to ask about Yanni because we see you guys have a very close um Bond? Is that the word I'm looking for? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I've been wondering if you had anything to do with her potentially coming here. Was there any involvement there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we we played together together last year at Fiorentina. Uh, yeah. That's how we got to know each other. Um, and yeah, the um, I did uh, maybe have some sort of say in it or, or not say, but like... Um, <laughs> They asked for, you know, do you have any IDs, like, send her back to mm-hmm. the um, But, yeah, no, a, a great girl, um, such a great, like, team player as well, and, like, yeah. a wealth of experience, um, has been the Danish national team captain for many, many years. Um, yeah, at the moment, she's not uh, not in the squad, but, like, someone who has, yeah, um, experienced, um, yeah, Elite level football at many different uh, places in Sweden, and she played for Arsenal in Italy. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm really happy that she in the end decided to um, yeah come here and um, yeah help us with with her experience. Um, yeah, obviously it's uh, we have 
uh, a lot of competition for places at the moment. Um, and we have uh, three very good center backs um, yeah. right now. So not everyone yeah, can play uh, 90 minutes every single uh, game. But um, what Malky rightly said like throughout the season it, is that um, individuals can win us games, but the team uh, can win us the league. Um, so yeah, everyone is uh, yeah very important, and and I'm just like on a personal level very happy that Jenny is here as well because uh, yeah, she's a she's a great great friend. Oh, we love Jenny. Yeah. I'm oh, really happy incredible. to see she's so great. Yeah. Like I remember um, we were excited because we were obviously she was kind of fitness and whatever, and she came in and just watched her play. She's just she's just so great. Like the way she is in the ball and how calm she is and the way she carries herself in the pitch. It's just. It's great. I love her. I think she's brilliant. Hello all, it is Rihanna and Card here from the Rangers Women's Football Show. Unfortunately, we lost Tessel in the middle of the interview. Yeah. Phone and died. Back. Yeah, my phone died, so unfortunately we didn't get Tessel back to finish the interview, but we hope you enjoy what uh, Karen and I did anyway. I thought she had a lot of really good answers, Karen, what did you think? Yeah, it was really good. I was really enjoying it. I was actually gutted that it ended. We've tried a couple of times to try and get her back on, but, you know, she's a very busy lady, so it's hard to get that organised. But, you know, I think we got a fair bit done. So, yeah, it'd be good for everyone to listen to that and enjoy it. Yes, so we hope you enjoy. Thanks for watching, guys. Keep the battle fever on.